is 6.30. I'm going to call the study session, uh, the City Council to order on January 10th, 2023. We've got uh, two uh, update items here today. First is a presentation from Excel Energy, and then the second we have a presentation from Public Works about our pavement management program. So I'm going to turn it over to the City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, members of the Council. Uh, Tonight, we're very fortunate to have Liz Gardner with Excel Energy with us, and um, I don't have much of an intro because it's truly coming from Excel, but I will say that when I saw the content that we'll be looking at tonight, I was excited because I really think it dovetails very nicely with Council's goals around environmental sustainability. Um, and so uh, it also, it also uh, dovetails well with the work that our staff has been doing. Public Works has really taken the lead for us in recent years on kind of launching some of these, some of our, our own initiatives. Uh, Deputy Public Works Director Brent uh, Sutherland is here tonight to kind of augment, supplement, and help answer questions if there are any about our existing programs. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our team. You also know Keith. I want to introduce Keith. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I don't know if there's any further uh, introduction, but it's Liz's presentation tonight. No, I think I'll just turn it over to Liz to, to get started. Perfect. That sounds good. Well, good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Thank you all so much for having me here. Just a little bit about me, and then I'll dive in. And um, my intent is hopefully to have plenty of time for questions. Um, there's probably... I got a couple of questions after I put the slides together, so I'll try to touch on some of the questions that came in um, in advance of the presentation as well. So, um, but yeah, please, please don't hesitate at the end to ask questions. So again, I'm Liz Gardner. I am the area manager for Excel for Adams, Arapaho, and Douglas counties, and then all of the, the municipalities within them. Um, I've been with Excel for... Actually, I think six years on Monday, this coming Monday, um, spent about five years of that um, more in our corporate social responsibility, leading our foundation and all of our employee um, volunteer programs, and then switched into more of a local government affairs role about a year ago. So I really appreciate the opportunity to <coughs> come tonight. I can be um, your sort of main point of contact for constituent concerns that come in. You know, you can always send them to staff first and then they can um, send them to me or you can, you know, always come to me directly should um, things, you know, things come up. And I know there have probably been um, concerns and questions that have come around rates and I'm happy to, to talk through um, utility prices this, this winter that we've all been feeling. But before I dive into that fun topic. So I'll set the stage a little bit. Um, I know the city obviously has some some sustainability goals, um, progressive sustainability goals across the city. And I'm, you know, really proud to think that as your utility provider in the city, that we can really help to, to set a great baseline um, for you when you're looking to achieve those goals just by the sort of the, the energy that is coming through through the pipes and the wires. Um, so about Colorado, Excel, for those of you that don't know, we serve eight states. Um, Colorado is now our largest sort of revenue generating um, state, obviously, given the, the growth that we've seen, um, particularly in comparison to some of the, the other states that we serve. Here in Colorado, we've got 1.5 electric 1.5 million electric, 1.4 million natural gas customers. And I, I know it doesn't always feel like it, um, but you know, a number that we're really proud of is about 99.98% electric reliability. Um, so 99% of the time that you flip the switch, the lights um, go on at your house or your business. When we think about kind of our priorities, they're really threefold. And, and these have been true um, for the really the entire six years that I've I've been at Excel, one is to lean the clean energy transition, two is to enhance the customer experience, and three is focused around keeping bills low. I would say when as we think about leading the clean en clean energy transition, sort of we talk about our guardrails, which are oftentimes reliability and affordability, um, and how do we sort of stay within those two guardrails as we as we move to a, a cleaner system for um, all of our customers. So we have, we were really the first utility company um, in the country to sort of put a, put our stake in the ground and say, we are going to deliver a 100% carbon-free electricity um, 
to all of our customers by 2050 um, with an intro milestone of 80% carbon free by 2030. Um, and then kind of following that, that um, sort of we put that declaration and the plan in motion um, for that about five years ago. Um, last November, um, we put forth sort of a similar plan in motion on the, the natural gas side of our business to have a net zero, so slightly different, but net zero um, natural gas um, system. And then kind of right on the heels of that, we put forth that um, our uh, clean transportation plan, our electric vehicle plan, to really say that one in five electric vehicle, one in five vehicles in our service territory will be electric vehicles. Um, and to have a zero carbon fuel accessible within one mile of all of our customers by 2050. So again, for, you know, I think some would say, what is a utility sort of what do we leave the, the electric vehicle space to sort of the private market? I think our feeling is we we have a product um, that powers these vehicles. And so how do we play, you know, within the regulated framework that we operate to make electric vehicles more affordable, more accessible, more um, easily to adopt for, for businesses and residents? Are those Excel planned in charge stations then? Is that the plan? Or? So it, there's kind of a, a suite of programs, and I'll talk a little bit about them. We um, have, so within Colorado, we have sort of any of our electric vehicle clean transportation programs are approved by the Public Utilities Commission through our transportation electrification plan. So it's a three-year plan. We'll file our next plan um, in actually May that will start in 2020, January of 2024. So in this current plan, we got approved to for Excel to own and operate uh, 25 charger charging public charging level two chargers across the state. We're in the process. We did an application process um, and sort of selected out where those sites would be. Again, it was kind of a pilot that was approved by the PUC. We are putting in sort of the trans TEP, Transportation Electrification Plan 2.0, that filing to have more opportunity for those because we had more applications than we could, um, you know, than we could accommodate in this, in this round. Are you partnering with electric vehicle um, manufacturers, or is it specific to Excel and then any one that, you know, there's different plugs? Yeah, different plugs, exactly. So it's not a specific manufacturer-specific charging station. And I'll just add, one thing that the city is doing is we're participating in um, a study that's being led by Arapahoe County, um, and actually XL has a consultant that's leading it. It's uh, called Partners in Energy, and it has to do with um, this very thing of you know where to put um, EV infrastructure um, within Arapahoe County. So Inglewood, Little Ten, Centennial, and you know uh, I guess a lot of the surrounding municipalities are participating. In that. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of those programs um, too, because again, there's there's kind of a sort of several verticals when it comes to our, our EV strategy. Um, so talked a little bit about this um, already again, but you can sort of see where we're where we're at um, on this path. We'll talk a little bit about the electric side and then a little bit about the natural gas side of things. But where we really are on this path to carbon free a carbon free system. The the benefits sort of when you think about our system and when we you know move to a carbon free system it's not just um, about carbon reduction it really does have sort of other environmental impacts that we look to measure so you know reduction in coal ash obvious sort of an obvious one is we um you know reduce and then you know soon to be eliminate the use of all our coal fire coal fired plants water consumption is obviously a big a big one that we look at you know down 29 percent since 2005 just as we look to to um reduce the carbon emissions on the system, nitrogen oxides, mercury, sulfur dioxide. So again, all of these other measures that sort of come as a, a byproduct in, in many ways of um, having a, the clean energy, um, a cleaner system. So what are we looking at sort of for 2030? And I actually think the next slide is a little bit better, but what the, our system will look like. We put forth again before the Public Utilities Commission what we call our electric resource plan. So it goes through a, a series of hearings. Um, as you might imagine, in this electric resource plan, sort of the, the targets and the milestones around the, um, the retirement of all of our coal plants was 
probably the biggest um, area of discussion um, in this. And the the four percent coal, those will actually all be retired in 2030. Um, so again, they'll they'll have a little bit of sort of scale back in 2030, but we'll all be off of the system by 2030. So that four percent, when you look at it in 2031, will be will be zero. But you can see a huge increase in wind on our system. Um, huge increase in solar. We still do um, anticipate having natural gas on our system and are looking at different strategies um, for the generation of natural gas and the technology around carbon capture of you know our natural gas plants. But we do still feel like it is a, um, until the technology gets to where we need it to um, in terms of dis really that dispatchable resources. So when the wind's not blowing, the sun's not shining and you know, I didn't get that. Oh, geez, Could you try again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking to you. Said, get out, um, move. Do you I know exactly. Just just have to um, you know where are we? Where are we getting our energy from? And so, right now, for us, we still believe natural gas is a is a, a very cost effective and helpful dispatchable resource on the system. How about hydrogen? Is that something in conversation? Yes, we are going to talk about hydrogen. Uh, yeah, um, I have a whole bunch of slides because yes, we we do. Um, believe that hydrogen is um, and is something that we are very actively moving towards using more of. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some of those programs. So thanks. So with the um, sort of this 2030, um, and again, that's this 2030 date is a pretty big, you know, not only is it a sort of an interim target for us to hit that 80%, but it's also where we have filed this electric resource plan, this is the generation that we will bring onto the system um, to, to help us to get there. Um, so you can see this is sort of all new, you know, total of 5,600 megawatts of new generation that we are planning to bring onto the system. Some of that is XL Energy owned and operated. Others is where we, you know, have a, a purchase agreement with providers. And we will do this spring, um, we put out our sort of a bid process. It's an RFP process that we have to do. Um, and really that's, it will be very interesting to see because even in this, the previous electric resource plan, again, that was sort of a turning point, I would say for us as a utility. And I think is a trend we're seeing across the country where the, the resources are coming in, you know, the bids are coming in less expensive to make it more feasible and way more. You know, I think in the last electric resource plan, we got something like 400 plus RFPs for the generation resources. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, you know, certainly what what comes out. Um, and again, that's all all here in in Colorado. Um, again, you see that storage um, sort of is a newer um, area that we that we are looking at. So how do we store, you know, wind and solar energy to then be able to dispatch it out when that resource isn't generating? Um, and so is a big is a big piece for us. We are also, we'll I'll talk a little bit about hydrogen, but we are also looking at a couple of other um, newer technologies. So our Hayden plant in um, Hayden, Colorado near Steamboat, we're looking at converting that to what's called molten salt storage, where you basically use molten salt as the, the generator um, or the fuel to generate energy. And you can use a lot of the existing infrastructure from that plant to generate resources that would have a 12 hour storage capacity. So again, a lot of, you know, stuff that our, you know, R&D, you know, innovation team are really looking at to, um, move towards these targets. What will this do to our cost as far as a homeowner? Yeah, so we have, um, you know, at Excel, we, we are, by the state, um, we, as far as it comes to the, specifically the clean energy transition, we are not allowed to do this greater than the rate of inflation. Um, so, you know, 3%. There are other, investments though that we have to make into into the system so you know i would say you know we've seen over the last couple of years that you know customers rates have gone up by about six percent um we are anticipating that you know as we make some of these upfront investments that will start to to level off you know you have to put in a lot of capital upfront capital investment in this um so again it's kind of a combination of we have a uh, mandate by the state that it can't be less than the rate of inflation, 
And that is also then kind of combined with Maybe less than or more than more than okay. the rate of inflation. Um, and then that's also combined with just the other, you know, uh, infrastructure upgrades we need to make in the system. Things like our wildfire mitigation work, um, the deployment of all of our smart meters and new technology across the system, you know, upgrading pole distribution infrastructure, things like that sort of is in combination with that when you think about your rates. So does Colorado subsidize any of the other states or are we on our own PNL? Our own. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And you will find, you know, across the board, I mean, when it comes to rates, you know, right now in Colorado, we pay about $28 a month less than the national than the national average. And when you look at other investor-owned utilities, we're about $32 less a month than the national average is sort of our utility peers across the country. So, you know, while I know sometimes it, you know, it feels like the rates, you know, keep going up, um, we do, the state, you know, I, we believe it's right, and the state has also mandated pretty aggressive targets on the greenhouse gas emissions and the clean energy transition, which does require some of these investments. Well, this year, especially last year, 2022, you know, it seems like, We've gone up more than 3%. It seems like we've probably gone up 10 to 15% on our bills, maybe even more. I don't know, depending on maybe. I'm I really confused. Um, Ours has so gone almost two thirds. I've percent. got properties that have increased by 25%, so I don't yeah. think the 6% thing. I don't, I, I don't. So, part of the, the challenge this winter, <clears throat> um, in particular, has been around the natural gas prices. So, for uh, us as a utility, what we purchase natural gas for is a direct pass-through cost to our customers. We have seen natural gas prices on average are up about 38% this year over last year. And that is a direct pass-through cost to our customers. And so that doesn't have to do with rates, your base rate um, that customers are paying. That is sort of a, almost like a surcharge. You know, it's a separate line item on your bill. Um, that customers are paying, which is why many of our customers are seeing their utility bills right now being 50%, 25%, 30, you know, more than they were in previous years is a direct result of those natural gas rates. The other piece that's sort of a temporary, again, not, it, it goes on your bill, but it's not a base rate, um, is the recovery of winter storm Yuri. So when winter storm Yuri happened, we basically, you know, we're in, in the market and we had to pre-purchase, you know, or purchase at a higher rate natural gas to sustain all of us during winter storm Yuri when, you know, we saw prices go, go through the roof. So that right now is about 8% additional on people's bills right now that's being recovered over 30 months. So it's a 30 month basically recovery that was, you know, again, the PUC, there was a, a case that was filed with the PUC. They looked at, you know, did Excel operate with prudence? Um, you know, did they do sort of everything that they could and, and gave us a certain amount that we were allowed to go back to our two customers to recover in their rates. And so that is another 8%. So you're not wrong in that, you know, when you think about your bills, if you've got 38% more on natural gas and 8% more on the recovery for winter storm Yuri, that people are seeing those 50%, you know, higher bills. If you- I'm not familiar with winter storm Yuri. It's the one in Texas where Texas wasn't quite prepared for- White. What? Huh? White? <laughs> not. White, yeah, I was being diplomatic there. Yeah, yeah so, so it, could we see it go down if, if Natural gas rates yes. go down? Yes, you will. Um, it, it seems it has something to do with the, um, you know, the new rules about when we can use energy now and the meters that got put in. That's when everything went through the roof. So um, <laughs> there's been a lot with rates. Um, and I, it, it's a great question. No, I, I mean, I, I don't mind. It's just when you say 3% and we're all sitting here looking at our bills that are 68% yeah, higher, I'm going to the base rate. There's all the other. Yes, yeah. exactly. So with, let me, let me do t um, just winter storm Yuri. And then I do want to talk about time of use because it's another great question and something that was on my list to talk about, if that's okay. Sure. I, I, I'm confused about the 3%. And the 68% I've seen. 
Yeah, that's all. That's the only thing I'm confused about. And, and even 38 plus eight doesn't come up to, for me 68 percent. And it, I mean, yeah. So, be when the initial question was around sort of the the energy transition, and so that is sort of less than can't do it more than the rate less than the rate of you know of inflation. There are other costs that are factored into the rates that we charge to customers. So again, when you look at, and I should pull, let's see if I can pull up, um, of course didn't print. Um, I'll, I'll send to you kind of a slide of sort of where our rates have been. Um, but again, if you look at kind of just the base <coughs> rates that we that we charge to customers, they on average have probably increased about six percent, sort of over the last several years. There's been other factors that have gone into rates, most notably natural gas prices, and which is far and away, I mean, that makes up 50% of you know people's bill is that commodity price. And then when it's up that much, it, it's a big factor. Um, and then so Winter Storm Uri, basically it was a, I want to say a, a major meltdown of the, the Texas grid. Um, so people were without power down in Texas that are part of what's called ERCOT. Um, and at the time, you know, basically all of their infrastructure, because it got so cold down there, could no longer operate. And really so that. what? They didn't plan for that. They did not I guess I just never it. knew the term for it, but I certainly remember that. Yeah. I guess the question was, why was everyone else paying for Texas's wonder? Because, you know, I mean, in that moment, I, exactly, <laughs> you have to make a decision, you know, we have to buy natural gas to, you know, operate our system. And at that period of time, you either have to make the decision, do we buy, you know, natural gas on the market for, you know, 10 times more than we normally would? Or do we just say, sorry, we're not going to buy natural gas and risk having outages in Colorado? Because it drove up the prices because people were buying natural gas from, you know, Texas was trying to buy it from, Colorado and trying to buy it from, you know, all of the surrounding states to get their system back online. I just say, why isn't the recovery fees being charged to Texas users? Because we all operate as independent, you know, regulated bodies, um, you know, that have an, you know, when you spend in our, you know, when we spend in our market, you know, in our, as a part of our regulated body, it's then recovered or, or the commission could have decided that, Sorry, Excel, you can't recover any of that. And, and we didn't recover. And it was cost, that, I mean, I guess the answer is it's cost associated with Colorado users because you bought the gas at that time for Colorado. Yes. Because, because you were so shifting important. resources. To yes, because it was so, you know, supply and demand issue. Um, so those are, you know, a couple of things. On time of use rates, um, so kind of two things have rolled out across Colorado. And I, I really do believe they are, they're good things. So one is the deployment of what's called smart meters. Um, and smart meters, most um, customers now um, have their smart meters um, deployed to their home. Some don't, depending on if you have rooftop solar um, and you net meter back to the system, that's like, a, it's a different meter. So those homes don't have smart meters. And then some that have a higher load. So some like larger homes don't yet have their smart meters again, because it's just a little bit different of a technology that you need if you're at a, a certain load on your on your home. Uh, so the benefit of smart meters, so in my viewpoint, is that you know right now on our system, we don't have two-way communication with your home. So if your power goes out, um, you know, at your premise, um, you know, we, until that first person calls in and says, hey, I have an outage, we don't know that your actual house is out. You know, we obviously have tracking along the lines and we can see, okay, this feeder is out, um, but we don't have house by house sort of information to know where outages are. So it allows for, you know, more rapid outage response times. It all, these smart meters will also allow for custom, really customer um, enabled programs to think differently about how we use how we all use our energy. I think for us, you know, as a utility company right now, you know, we have, if you think about the hottest day in the summer on the, you know, when everyone's got their AC going and they're, you know, home after work, doing all the things, you know, we have to build infrastructure 
resources to serve the grid on the hottest day in July, um, you know, to make sure that we have enough power. What happens, you know, is, is people, you know, are using more things. We have just seen that peak get higher and higher and higher. What we really are trying to work with our customers to do is to start thinking, you know, a little bit of the like water messaging of like use only what you need. You know, the, the cheapest kilowatt of energy is the one that you don't use. And so how do we start to incentivize and talk to our customers about helping us to sort of flatten that, flatten that bell curve. So it doesn't look as much like this and it looks a little bit more like this. It helps so we don't overbuild wind farms and solar farms and, and resources that aren't being used 75% of the time, but we need them to serve the 25% of the time. Um, and that we, you know, it just helps for better grid management. Again, we think about that as we bring electric vehicles on the onto the grid. How do we start to better manage the grid? And so with time of use rates, people can opt out of time of use rates. You can go on a flat rate um, and it's no, you know, no problem. If you opt out of a smart meter, there is a charge to customers if they opt out of a smart meter. The reason for that is because then we still have to send somebody out to physically go out and need your reader. And if you think about, you know, for, you know, going to read one home here and one home, you know, 45 minutes away and another home, another 45 minutes away, it's, it's just a very expensive human resource um, to, you know, because you're not going to an entire neighborhood to read 5,000 homes. And so, but with time of use rates, you can opt out. You can go on a flat rate. There's, you can opt in, you can opt out. You, do, you don't have to make a, a finite choice, but really with time of use rates, there's a peak rate, sort of a higher price per kilowatt that you pay really between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Um, it goes up a little bit starting at like 2 p.m. and then it's really 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. You pay a higher rate for the energy and then it's a lesser rate the other you know hours of the day. And so how do we start to talk to incentivize customers to or de-incentivize customers to do things like running your dishwasher, charging your vehicle, run, doing your laundry during those peak hours um, when we know that demand on the system is the highest. So if people don't make any behavioral changes and they're on time of use rates, they will see higher rates. They will see higher bills. If people make small incremental, you know, changes, like we're, we're like always, and you know, I speak from my own personal experience. We are like always get the bill of shame at our house and we are like finally in line with our neighbors at our, at our house because we've started to like actually think about when we use the, the product that is coming to our house. So, you know, I don't know if that totally answers your question. It makes all the sense in the world for us to watch our resources, but at the same time, raising rates. It, it, we, so now I'm watching my resources and now my rates keep going up. I mean, it, and it was significant. I don't know about you, but next door is all, all about it. Yeah. And if you, I mean, I, it, I've got my bill up right here. It's also the weather. I mean, it was 12 degrees colder this December than last December. I was going to ask about that too. Like yeah. with no, climate we change, global warming? <laughs> yeah, with climate change, if you see in the summer specifically, many more days of 95 plus temperatures, that that's going to increase our rates. I mean, yeah. it's, so it's, and that's, it's the and, same and, thing with cold the cold temperatures Absolutely. do as well. We but saw I feel that like this winter. I mean, it was significantly was colder awful. this November than it was last November. I mean, it was Jeez. warm last November. And so people just weren't turning on their, their heat and their fur, you know, and using the product as much. Um, so you might see your rates high now, but they're probably going to go back down again, right, at some point yeah. in the springtime. Well, time. I think it's a lot of supply and demand, right? I think it's supply and with, demand. with current policy out there, I'm talking about government policy and, and you know, restricting the production of natural gas, it's affecting everybody. Real quick, how do people know if they're on a smart meter? So you uh, should have gotten like information saying, you know, we're coming, you know, to your house. And then like would have gotten like a door hanger. If you don't know or like nothing was left and you're not sure, I would just call our customer okay. care I team. I mean, you can't look at the meter right now and say, well, that's the old one, that's it, the new one? It depends. If you had a really old meter, you know, that like, you know, in a much older... I would say probably a not much older, is but it digital. Yeah, no. 
So that uh, might do it. I, I it's not on. digital, and it's not a smart meter. I'm there are no <laughs> iterations in between. Well, I know I have it from I just physical wanted people spin meter to yes, like a, a QR exactly, code like, meter, and you can actually you can actually tag your meter with the QR code. It'll link to your Excel account, and then you can actually see your energy consumption throughout the day. Assuming you have a smart meter. Assuming you have a smart meter yeah. and not a spinning dial. <laughs> and like, you know, you know, and it'll start like as we deploy the meters. That was sort of step one. Then you know, as people start to use the app, you'll start to get more real time data to say, and you know, even like push notifications to say, "Hey, I see you used way more electricity this week than you did last week. Like, what were you doing?" You know, I mean, to help to educate people because that's the thing. It's a little bit hard to know when it's so. Kind of ambiguous. Well, Denver Water does the same thing, right? Like you get your bill and you'll see yeah. you'll, you're kind of rated against other people in your neighborhood, whether, you know, you get the green smiley yeah. face or the angry red face. Yeah, you know, they exactly. Over, so. <laughs> it's easy to read. Um, <laughs> so let me keep going. I just, am I okay? Okay. okay. Um, and just talk a little bit about... Um, some of our electric vehicle programs, and then I'll talk a little bit about natural gas and hydrogen. Um, so again, the city has been actively involved in our Partners in Energy program to really look at sort of an EV roadmap um, for our Arapahoe County. But when we think about kind of our EV programs, there's sort of three main goals um, around information and advice. You know, we know this is a new-ish area, so how do we get information out there to educate um, customers to help with planning, to help with, you know, fleet thinking about transitioning their fleet of vehicles, um, lowering upfront costs, so rebates, you know, make ready charging infrastructure, charging, you know, both company and customer own, and then optimizing, optimizing the grid. So how do we think about smart charging, time varying rates for people that are charging off, off peak hours? Um, so this is a lot in here, and I will not go through all of these programs, but this just gives you a little bit of an idea. We've got kind of like six verticals, I would say, of programs sort of with equity. And, you know, we have a lot of high um, for low income or income qualified customers and in communities that are um, high emissions communities, HEC -E communities, um, sort of additional rebates um, in those areas. But... Under residential, um, you can see we've got a home wiring rebate. So if somebody needs to do wiring, um, you know, in their home, we have um, we have that where we just provide a rebate. We also have our EV Accelerate, which is where XL Energy will own um, and install, or like will install and basically own the charging infrastructure in your home, and then you pay kind of a rate back. I think it's like ten bucks a month um, back to Excel on your utility bill. Um, for that charging infrastructure. And again, we sort of with the infrastructure encourage people to charge um, after hours. We've got multifamily programs. So um, electric vehicle supply infrastructure, EVSI. Um, we've got new construction rebates for new developments going in, um, particularly multifamily where we'll offer rebate for the, the wiring um, or the installation of charging infrastructure. Um, what, would the, what would the charging services be for multifamily? Yeah, so that would be um, similar where we would both kind of similar to residential, either a rebate or where we would install um, that charging infrastructure. Well, residents was telling me about the program that lives here. They have, I don't know, there's 30 residents in their building and they went out, Excel went out and talked to all the uh, owners and said, do you want an EV station? And I think you, if, if you had five, they would do it. I think they got seven or eight and basically it's just $10 a month and they each get their own EV station in their own parking spot. Yeah. So yep. they approach Excel or Excel approach them? Uh, I don't know which way it went. I, th I can't remember. Yeah, probably, so, probably somebody reached out That's um, awesome. to us. Yeah. Multifamily, you know, I would say just as we think about sort of t our next filing, um, multifamily is tough. Like it's just kind of a harder one to figure out. It's harder for us to get in touch with people in sort of multifamily because, again, it's you've got the residents and then, you know, maybe you have an HOA or an owner that – so multifamily, I would say, is – been one of our harder ones to sort of like crack that nut and figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. Commercial, um, very similar again. So the charging infrastructure, um, rebates for charging. Um, we have XL Energy owned and operated um, charging infrastructure. Again, we're same thing. We'll install it. We'll own it. Um, 
pay a fee back to us. And then we also have a rebate for small businesses um, if they install charging infrastructure. Um, the advisory services is what talked a little bit about. So the community action sort of planning, working with Arapahoe County to really develop what is our what is our um, clean transportation goal? Where do we need to put our focus? Are we going to focus on residential business? Where do we have gaps in where our charging infrastructure is? We also have our um, fleet program. So it's fleet advisory Fleet Electrification Advisory Program, FEEP, um, where we'll work with municipalities to look at, we basically put track, you know, like trackers on all of the fleet vehicles for a municipality um, to sort of, and then help to them to optimize and identify what would be the most realistic ones to convert to electric vehicles. So again, we- Sorry. So we're actually doing that right now with our fleet is um, we're using, we have a telematic system that tracks uh, I think it's a little over 40 of our vehicles, and so we're using that data um, with Excel's help to decide which ones would be best to convert to EV. Yeah. So, and then um, a school, school bus rebate. So combined with the EPA, and if someone gets an EPA grant to electrify a school bus, combined with the rebate that we offer, it, it really covers the entire cost of um, a, an electric school bus. Um, this sort of PRI, this is like where we're looking at sort of these innovative projects, kind of the research space. Um, and then we have rebates for um, new and used EVs for income qualified customers. Um, so really to, to help to offer rebates for income qualified customers um, for the purchase or the lease of an electric vehicle. How receptive have the schools been around the school bus rebate? You know, we've got a couple um, across our... Um, like across our eight states, most notably here in Colorado and in um, Minnesota that have that have converted. I would say it's slower, you know, where they're not necessarily converting a whole fleet. I think it's largely driven by if someone gets an EPA grant to do it, then they'll they'll also convert. So we have a Aurora Public Schools. We've worked with them to electrify um, some of their fleet here in Colorado. Um, and then this is real small text, um, but you all have these slides. Again, I think this just gives like an interesting sort of picture of the infrastructure. And then again, I won't go through all of this, but it does give an interesting kind of cost breakdown <coughs> of when you think about from the distribution pole to the transformer to sort of the, the um, meter cabinet and the panel and kind of who with some of these different programs, sort of what Excel will cover and what is needs to be covered by the customer, both for level two and then sort of level three or DC fast fast chargers. So um, again, we're really trying to think about it from sort of the full cycle of, of the eco ecosystem. <coughs> um, so then I'll just touch real quickly on natural gas. Um, so Again, we have a goal to have a net zero natural gas system by 2050 with an interim target of a 25 reduction in green, um, greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Sort of how do we believe we are going to do that? Again, I think for us, um, you know, we believe that the, the pipes that are in the ground have a, have a role to play now and, and will still continue to have a role to play. And there's a way for us to, to get to a net zero system even, you know, while still using the system. Um, so, you know, first we have a significant purchasing, you know, influence. So how do we um, purchase exclusively natural gas from certified low methane emission producers um, by 2030? So right now we're not exclusive. We've made a lot of um, progress in that area. How do we think about the actual pipes and methane capture and making sure there, you know, there isn't any methane leaking from the cut? leaking from the pipes. Um, and again, we've deployed this new technology across a large portion of our um, system where we have a much faster leak detection, um, where we can go in and, and repair those leaks to ensure that everything that should be in the pipe stays in, in the pipes. Um, and then again, the introduction of hydrogen blending into, into the system. And then, you know, certainly customers have a role to play just as we think about the, the electric side of things and how do we you know, lower the bell curve when it comes to our electric use. Same thing on the natural gas side of things and how do we sort of have new and voluntary programs. We hear a lot about um, certainly electrification, you know, going all electric in someone's home. Um, we would anticipate that, again, we're not anticipating 
pushing that entirely, but you know, do we have customer programs or, you know, incentives to they're building a new home to move to an electric, you know, all electric home. Um, and again, so that will be a kind of an expansion of programs that we have. Just before you jump off that, yeah. I don't, I guess I don't even understand that net zero vision for natural gas. That means you're zero natural gas by 2050. Sorry. Um, so net zero means basically zero greenhouse gas emissions from our natural gas business. So that would be sort of the the net zero. So it's not doing away with right. with the system okay. at all. It's having no greenhouse gas emissions coming from the natural gas system. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. So one of the questions that came up, and again, this is there's a lot on here, but there is um, sort of a lot in concept around really building out. And the governor polis has. Um, also put forth, you know, a lot of interest in having Colorado be a hydrogen hub. So um, hydrogen is obviously a clean, a clean fuel um, that right now is not, you know, I would say super widely um, used when it comes to people heating their, heating their homes and businesses, but it has a lot of the same um, sort of dual role um, or, you know, dual ability as natural gas does. And so a couple of the things, um, one of the things that we're really excited about that we'll be looking at doing um, in this kind of the next three years is hydrogen blending demonstration. Um, so this is where we will, you know, as we know, we want to start to bring more hydrogen um, onto the system as part of our, you know, as part of our energy mix. We have to kind of start somewhere. You can't just all of a sudden one day say, all right, we're going to turn off the natural gas going through the pipes and put hydrogen through. And so... We are starting to roll out hydro, sort of these hydrogen pilots, hydrogen demonstrations. Um, you know, there. I don't want to get put the cart before the horse or whatever, the horse before the cart, but there is a, a potential project that we may be wanting to look at in the city of Littleton when it comes to a hydrogen demonstration project, and where you would really start to, you would start at low levels um, of sort of blending into the system. You use an existing utility infrastructure. It would be kind of a two-year two-year demonstration project and then, you know, slowly increase it, you know, so you go maybe 2% and then 5% and then 10% would be sort of the max that we would look at um, in the blending, you know, in the blending mix. It doesn't require any changes to someone's home, the way they use their their stove, their, you know, all of their appliances runs the exact same. Um, we're also, you know, looking at up in Adams County, there's uh, some locations in Aurora. So that's something that we're, you know, looking at. Um, for, you know, in the next several years um, of rolling out as we look at this fuel source and bringing this more, um, I would say, too commercial on the system. Sure. Hey Liz, is it going on also, like in another state? Is this a pilot project? Probably Washington, I would think, would be huge for hydrogen. Yeah, so... Um, That's why all those big techs are there. Yeah, so there's two... Um, obviously, in Europe, you know, they've used the use of hydrogen for years. Um um, there's been a project in Hawaii. They have done a lot with hydrogen. SoCal Gas, um, Enbridge has done a lot. There's been a project up in um, Washington. So I mean, they, isn't that what those big rivers are creating? It's hydrogen. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so so is there any downside to it? You know, I think um, to me the downside is you know I think you say hydrogen and there's maybe a, a bit of pause of like safety. Um, I we believe it's you know it's very safe. It's you know we would apply the same safety practices that we apply to our natural gas system to the use of hydrogen. Um, I think the other piece is just as you increase the um, sort of blend, kind of then I do think there, you know, maybe down the road, if you get to a certain point, there may have to be like certain modifications to the system or to the end users. So again, not at sort of lower, lower levels of blending. So I think that's something, um, and then I think the other, you know, piece for people is just the, the physical um, infrastructure. You know, right now, you know, with these demonstration projects that we would be looking at, it would be on sort of on-site storage. You wouldn't be, you know, piping it in from somewhere. You'd have on-site storage of hydrogen. Um, so again, there's sort of a, an infrastructure um, impact that I think people could see as a downside. So um, the last thing I just wanted to mention um, 
is just obviously we're working really closely with the team of Public Works um, as we start to think about sort of undergrounding the utility lines in the sort of downtown um, corridor of Littleton. Um, you all have your undergrounding fund, so 1% of electric sales um, go into what is called the 1% fund, um, and those funds can be used for undergrounding utility, you know, taking lines from overhead to underground um, that are, you know, that are, there's, you know, in the right of way is kind of the main um, stipulation and they can't have service laterals on it. So again, I think we're having some great initial conversations. You have about 5 million in that 1% fund. Um, the undergrounding of downtown will probably be uh, expensive. Um, so it's good that you've, you know, built up. Um, Look, just as a side note to that, just, just remember that on a poll, they're not the only thing on the poll. And we have to pay for everybody else on the poll. So it, that only covers it. So if you got a poll, you're going to underground, there's five utilities on it. This covers their portion. And we have to pay for the other four that might be hanging on that pole too. So it's... Um, What's the biggest cost here? Obviously the trenching, that's the whole reason we're trying to do it with Denver Water is the trenching and the piping of that. Mm -hmm. Lay down your conduit. Do you, do you lay down one giant conduit or do you lay down five separate conduits for each utility? It depends. Okay. So it's that's the answer that, you know, it's the best answer I can get, but it depends. And one of the other things is part of that we, we're working on um, and have been working on for a few years is um, joint trenching. So that even um, we, we do open a trench, we're trying to move everybody into it. And also the concept of adding in shadow conduit, which may not be used now, but sure. we have it for the future to pull additional fiber or things like that. So, so how, do we access, how is that fund accessed? So that it sits under Excel's purview and then essentially we as a city go out to Excel to access underground fund. Yep, funds. We work with them project on a by project, project by project basis, or okay. sometimes someone will request a project through Excel, and then we'll make a decision whether we think that's a good investment or not. Gotcha. Um, and then uh, one of our big hurdles to this, honestly, um, when we got here, was there was no undergrounding master plan, which was a limitation that Excel has in place that would not allow us to ac access the fund. So we had to get through the process of developing an underground master plan so that there was some decision-making criteria about how the fund gets utilized, how we prioritize our needs, and how that fits into Excel's goals and priorities as well. So um, we've gotten over that hurdle. So is, is $5 million even close to covering the Excel portion of that? On Main Street? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Okay, but, so, so it's close. But, well, one of the things that I'll just kind of go to that for a second right. is that one of the challenges um, that you often have in downtowns is that the infrastructure there tends to be some of your oldest in the city from all the utilities. <clears throat> and so then when you think about things like, say, activating alleys, um, a lot of times the, the power supply isn't strong enough to, say, put a compactor in an alley to move all the businesses onto one Correct. trash outlet. So you have to go through the process of upgrading that infrastructure as well to make it whole. Um, so that'll be, we're actually, we had our first um, interview today for the team to be working. So pretty soon that'd we'll be have an answer to that. Jim, I'd be interested in, you know, planning today for 2025, right? We're yeah. at 2025 and not just this utility, but the other four yeah. utilities or five utilities. So. We know it's coming, right? We know it's coming. Let's start putting a little bit of money away as much as we can to, to help. Yeah, that's part of the game plan. We, we yeah. fully expect it to underground the utilities as we go through that project. Sure. Part of it is so we don't burn down the buildings because the Christmas lights are attached to them. You know, that kind of process. So, you know, we'll get there. But, yeah, our goal has always been to bring that underground as we do it. It's like a Chevy Chase setup over there. You're right. <laughs> what are the other utilities? Um, you have Comcast. You have other fiber companies. Um, you have all those kind of companies to hang on. Center. That's going to be a, a big capital product to come out of this plan. That we're, that we're Are we going to talk a little bit about that maybe during our retreat? Or if it's even worth it? Yeah. Something. Yeah, it, and it'll be part of the next update as we start this, this project and come yeah. back to council with the, the next downtown plan update. We can certainly highlight right. the utility yeah. the project. It's so awesome to get it all off the ground. <laughs> That's the goal. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. That's so much better. Um, awesome. Well, I think those are really my main, you know, I would just say, again, I, you know, I, I hear you, like I read next door too. I know the public sentiment, um, you know, for Excel has been, has been challenging. You know, we feel it, feel it at our, at our house, the rates. Um, but I just, 
you know, our employees live, work here. We give back to the community. You can see a couple of the, the statistics up here. Last year, our employees donated 22,000 hours of volunteer time. We have a, a corporate foundation um, that's not paid for by our by our rate payers um, that contributes to nonprofits all over the state um, of Colorado. So we've invested in um, Highline Canal, we've invested in Littleton Public Schools, just to name a few down this way. And I would just say certainly if there are ever organizations or causes um, that you know are near and dear to you all or to the city that you want us to engage with or volunteer with or you know bring our teams out to, please don't hesitate to reach out to me because Again, we we want to be more than just more than just a company that you know provides um, gas and electric service. Although that is important, um, you know we all we all live here and, and work here as well. So with that, I think you can see a little. Liz, how do we or how is Excel protecting us from doing what California's done? I think California jumped so fast, so deep into the electric side of it that it's draining their power grid, and there's they have blackouts all the time. And obviously a different animal, much larger state than uh, uh, Colorado. But we have a tendency to do whatever California does. Well, that's the direction we're going. That's why I asked the question. You know, what, what? I had rolling blackouts growing up there, so. <laughs> What's that? I had it's rolling blackouts new. growing up there before they went to not new and they still have. <laughs> that, yeah. So it's dumb. I don't know. It just seems like, you know, yeah. I've heard of the stat that, you know, if the whole United States were to go completely electric tomorrow, we'd have 72 seconds. To, to power up the United States, 72 seconds. It's so bad. it's, you think about that in 2050, we're trying to create this, this, you know, and I think, I think we're going the right direction. Don't get me wrong. I just, Absolutely. you know, I'm asking a lot of these questions because these are questions that people are listening are, are wondering about, yeah. especially the bill and with hopes that, you know, you know, going forward, we'll, you know, next year in December, we'll see our bills come down a little bit. Maybe, you know, I don't know. So I would say a couple of things to that. I mean, I think we work hard at the at the state legislator to make sure that we feel as though that the targets that we're setting as a state are are attainable. Um, you know, and I think sometimes we struggle and we've pushed back. There was a, a bill that was run last last session that we pushed back on that was sort of moved the the targets up even faster um, than where and you know than where we are going. Um, and so we pushed that back on that because again we feel like you have to do this in sort of a a slow slow ish and pragmatic approach um i think the biggest barriers you know or things that keep our you know leadership up at night is just the advancement in technology we know you know the 80 percent we feel pretty like very confident about i think it's that final 20 percent to get to 100 percent that you know, we know there still has to be advancements in technology, whether that's carbon capture, battery storage, um, again, that dispatchable resource, the thing you can turn on and off really quickly, like you can turn on and off a natural gas plant or a, a, um, or a coal fired plant. And so um, to me, I would say doing it solely and pragmatically. I think the other piece, you know, in California, you have a lot of community choice energy, you know, where it's kind of smaller, you know, sort of almost smaller, you know, energy. pockets of, of people, you know, sort of buying their, buying their energy and sort of managing their own little grids. It's like the best way it's really, someone else would describe that much more articulately than I did. But um, I think for us, you know, we, we feel like as, you know, I know we're big, but as being a, a regulated utility and the size that we have, we're able to purchase, you know, and build big wind farms and big solar farms sort of at a, um, and size that allows for us to do it more more affordably than you know the the legislation there was legislation last year that they had to do a study around community choice energy because it was something that was coming up in Colorado and again it showed the cost to customers would be way higher than what they're when than what they're paying now and people you know again we know already feel like they're paying way too much so any other questions I go on and on but I'm, I'm, I'm done for now I'm just keeping quiet on this whole deal. <laughs> Inflation Reduction Act uh, funds yeah. coming through for a lot of home energy efficiency uh, rebate programs and stuff like that. Anything on the horizon for 2023 or 2024 that's kind of new and fun? I know the heat pump, hot water heater program has seen kind of 
slow adoption obviously but anything else you guys see on the horizon yeah um so i would say as far as like home sort of rebates um we have like i haven't heard that we're going to expand or add to i mean right now we have programs for you know income qualified weatherization hvac water heat pumps um, smart heater rebates led rebates smart thermostat rebates, you know, so I would just say, I, so I haven't heard of them adding any additional programs, um, but certainly, you know, right now I feel like if there's anything that's powered by electricity in your home and you're planning to upgrade, replace it, there is, there's a rebate, um, at least of some size available. Um, the other thing, you know, and I don't know if anybody knows about this, if everybody knows about this program, but Excel has our home energy audit. So it's a free service, you know, where we'll go out to people's homes and again, you know, look at where, what systems do they have? What could be upgraded? What, you know, would qualify for a rebate, you know, replace, LED, you know, um, all the bulbs with LED light bulbs, things like that. So I always feel like just for like a quick talking point for customers, um, if they're asking, I feel like they've never done a home energy audit. It's a really, it's an easy free way to just get yeah, people I've done that. Homes. That's that's a really good thing to do for everybody. Yeah. I mean, and it's easy. And, you know, I mean, so, we have like, you know, way more, way fewer LED light bulbs in our house than I thought. And they replaced them all, you know, like just little things. And as like I recall, that. the energy audit didn't cost me anything. It's just, it was free. Yeah, free. free. Right. Yeah. And you actually get a rebate for doing it. I think we got like $50 off of our, off of our bill just for doing the program. So. One more quick question on the rate increases. I think in December, customers were notified about a potential increase in the fall of 2023. Is that passed? Was that proposal accepted by the Colorado Public Utilities thing? Yeah, it was modified just a little bit, um, so reduced just a little bit, and that's your natural gas for the natural gas rates. Um, is that then related to what you talked about with Texas? Is that no, <laughs> it's all, it is separate. That, you know, I'm, just as a side note on rates, one thing we are trying to work with the legislator and the PUC to do is that is to do forward rate making. So and this gets way more in the weeds than you want to. But right now we basically spend money, you know, or and then go to the PUC and say, okay, you know, what is you know, what is recoverable and then that adjusts to rates versus being able to say, okay, customers for the next five years, this is what your rates are going to be. And so right now we have to basically file rate cases with the Public Utilities Commission every year for what we spent essentially the previous year. So it is a challenge for customers because there's a little bit of a lack of in some ways predictability to know like what's coming. Whereas we would rather file for five years so people know these are going to be my rates for the next five years. So anyways, yeah, and I have actually have um, here a fact sheet just on the, the natural gas rates that you're referring to that I can leave. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you all Thank you. very Thank much. You. I will leave my um, card so everybody has my um, contact information and then just a, a couple of other um, handouts. So thank you Excellent. all very much. Before you go, I will actually direct the city manager to reach out to you about getting some of the information about the uh, energy audit and the EV accelerate to if we can get it in a little bit for both ways for our residents to kind of know more about that. That'd be as good to go. The heat pump hot water heaters. No? I'm like you use a heat about, yeah, yeah, as I say, that's like relatively new. Also, cold weather. Anyway, there's a bunch of new stuff. Yeah, but yeah I mean, I, I don't know if you call Excel and get the energy audit or. But I I'm think just saying to put it in the little reporter. Yeah, I think that would be perfect. Yeah. perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Have a good night. Thanks, Liz. So Keith's staying put, I think, right? All right, Keith. <laughs> The other public works team uh, come on up to the... You want to take a break before we start? Anyone want a break? No. I think, I think you can go quickly, right, Keith? We don't yeah, need... five minutes. For sure. <laughs> I know this is uh, a topic of lack of interest. Well, we, lo we lost council of our growth, so... Lack of interest. In Where's the asset management need? system? Where is it? No, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah.
Totally Jerry doesn't care about the payment plan anymore because his streets are done. I, I don't see where this, <laughs> I, this is the same plan you gave us like years ago. What are you going to complain about now? Jerry, there's a slide in. I'll just tell you. I'll just tell you ahead of time. You changed the date. We're going to spend, he we're gonna spend more money. He's a satisfied yeah, customer. We're going to have an entire budget in this period. That's because we haven't spent money in the past. That's all I can say. That's all I can say. Inflation caught up over the last 37 years since it was last paid, right? Hey, what about your PCI? We changed the dates on the minus. Well, you saw the maps included. That's good. I saw the maps. I compared the old master to any city. Yeah, and I got money to use. Yeah, I read it. So, like in the But it's good information. It's still good information. All right. All right. Thanks, Mayor. Well, it is just a. It's it's an understatement to say it's a goal for this council to move forward with with. Reinvestment in our in our infrastructure, and specifically to implement the uh, Measure Three A revenues that we have now been been building up for this work. Uh, I'll steal the thunder here. We have thirty six million dollars in the works for twenty twenty three, which is several fold more. And I'm sure Keith can tell us more precisely several fold more than we than we have uh, ever had before. And a lot of this work is going, you'll see about 12 and a half million from uh, Measure 3A that's going to be deployed largely on our streets and some other direct work for the city. We also have a whole lot of important grant funded work that we're partnering with uh, the state and some others on that is enabled by the, some, uh, some matching funds from the uh, city. So um, tonight we want to, this is really the kickoff to our, our public public information campaign about all this work. We think just as important as doing the work is going to be telling the public, telling the community that we're doing the work, when we're doing the work, making sure that there's a consciousness about that. So we want to share that plan first with you. Tonight we're focusing on 2023. You'll have a study session a couple of months that gets back into the longer range planning with, um, with Measure 3A and some of our other capital funds. Um, but uh, with that, uh, we'll also, I will say that we'll bear, we'll ask your, uh, your patience with a little bit of engineering school, because we think it's important that the council understands kind of a little bit of the, the, the what and the why and how we're choosing to do different street, uh, pavement preservation treatments, for instance, in various areas so that you can answer questions and you have an understanding about how we're making those, those choices. So with that, I'll turn it over to Keith and Brent Thompson, our city engineer, and Matt Matazuski, our capital projects manager. Ian is calling Matt on the street. No, we're trying to work on it. So. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I can get with Tyler about that. <laughs> exactly. So we um, we want to touch base with you. Over the next few months, you're going to see a few things. We're going to talk to you tonight about um, pavement, pavement management, kind of what we did to get here and what, what's going forward. Um, we're going to visit with you next month and talk about, you know, two years ago, we adopted the city's first transportation master plan, and we're going to come to you with a report that shows the progress that we've made against the goals in that plan um, and where we're headed in the future. Um, and then we're going to visit, uh, Tiffany and I will be here to visit with you in a little bit about the bigger spending for 3A. Um, since this is just part of it. So um, those are all exciting things coming forward. So, But this is a space where we wanted to talk to you a little bit about what are the goals are of our pavement management program, how we're going to be attacking it, what we did this past year, some of the challenges that we had um, from an industry perspective, which some of them are still out there, what, that, what our program is going to look like in 23, how that compares to the past, and then uh, we're going to touch a little bit about how we get the messaging out about the program itself when we're in neighborhoods, when we do work, when we do those kind of things. So uh, Brent's our city engineer. 
Um, and so he uh, lives and breathes this every day. Matt lives and breathes this even more. Matt's more in the realm of actually sniffing the asphalt. Um, it's a little bit different. <laughs> different you know, you know we're at that, there's nothing like the smell of hot asphalt. <laughs> so, um, so that's what we're going to touch on today. But as uh, Jim said, one of the things we wanted to do was just talk for a few minutes about what is what what does really pavement management mean? And and you're going to see pictures and all those kind of things. You see, I prepared this presentation as opposed to <coughs> Mark Ralph, where there would be Gantt charts and I put pictures in. Um, and why those things are important is because, like right now, um, we're in discussions with um, fiber companies that want to come in and put some more fiber in the community. Also, there's some action going on in the state legislature about that, and it's about a thing called micro-trenching. Why is that important? Well, it impacts our ability to do pavement maintenance, or the strategies they want to use, and it impacts the life of your street. So we just want to do a little bit of background so when those things come in front of you from a discussion standpoint or, or something, that you have some background on that a little bit more. So we'll dive right into that. Sure. Um, overall, uh, these are some of the things that are different from the places that we've been in the past, that you've been part of the investment in, is the asset management program that we have. Um, we have much more extensive electronic assessments in the field versus windshield surveys of what our streets look like. That's the technical term for it, a windshield survey, versus more electronic measurement about what's out there assessing the pavement and the value of it. Um, we were actually joking because we had several staff painting circles on the street today. Um, small circles to determine where we are going to do coring. Um, and we're doing more of that, which helps us make decisions about the level of work that you have to do in a particular section of street or segment of roadway. Um, we also have reevaluated how we deliver services. For the longest time in this community, um, a lot of the pavement was delivered by, we jointly owned for the last 25 years, have jointly owned a milling machine with Englewood. Um, and it's Pretty old and pretty interesting. And then we would share that with them and then we would also do a lot of our own paving and we would also do, we do our own striping and then in exchange for some other things we do, like long line striping for our neighbors in Englewood, trade-off services to help each other out. We've invested a lot over the last several years to up our game. It's the asset management, the technology, it's investing in our people, um, it's sending our people to Alabama um, to uh, participate in the National Asphalt Pavement Training Programs to make them to continue to improve their expertise. And that's a lot of the things that we continue to do. And then one of our biggest challenges here is, is balancing what we have and what we do. And we're in an interesting situation here, unlike a lot of our peers in the front range, because most of our infrastructure has been here a long time already. We're not building greenfield developments um, uh, very often. And so a lot of our stuff... Greenfield would be like um, Evergreen. It's Evergreen something field. brand new. New world land. Probably. New world land. Like a new new land, land being developed. Yeah. New yeah. stuff. Yeah. There we go. Like <laughs> yeah. so, sorry about that. So, you know, as opposed to everything here, you know, it's pretty much here. So all of our stuff, no matter what we do, is context sensitive. How do we make it fit in the, in the neighborhood and the circumstance and all those things? So that's always part of our, our decision-making process. And a lot of the stuff that you see there has been very evolutionary for this organization over the last several years, which is, which is exciting to help us get there. Hey, as well, man. Yeah, so I'm going to start here. Um, as you all know, my name is Matthew Mashuski. I'm one of the people who has been to Alabama, and I do a lot of work with Kappa. So, kind of scares me when we go to Alabama to get educated <laughs> with the national centers, and then the other ones in Minnesota for cold weather testing. <laughs> um, so, pavement management. I'm sure you've all seen this before. Um, you'll see the image on the left. You have your wearing surfaces. It's made up of uh, hot mix asphalt or you know, it's a mixture of asphalt cement um, with angular uh, rock, pretty much. It holds it together, it gives you structure, but it is flexible at the same time, which allows it to move and kind of absorb some heavier loads from uh, trash trucks or during the winter when you have severe freeze-thaw cycles. A newer road is better to um, absorb some of those extremes that an older road wouldn't. Um, underneath that, you're talking about? yeah. So underneath that, you have your base and sub base, which is just a, a, a additional support and structure. <laughs> How many inches? Usually, your uh, base would be about six to twelve. 
For the city of Littleton, we are residential streets. You'll see about six inch asphalt on a new overlay. Uh, as time goes on, that gets a little bit thinner over um, on the edges due to some of the milling and repaving procedures. It's just kind of how those procedures work. It's difficult to maintain that uniform section over decades. Um, and so that's generally what you want to start with. Uh, the image on the right shows what happens over time. So, <laughs> so scary favorite slide. Right there. When you put down that asphalt, say that's in front of my house, right? The one on the left or the right? Gary's <laughs> um, been telling me it's the one on the left for sure. Yeah. So when you put that down initially, it's beautiful. You know, you have a nice black surface. It smells nice and fresh <laughs> um, if you're into that. But over time, uh, something we have a lot here is sunshine. Asphalt humor is the best. Eh? <laughs> Very dry. Um, <laughs> oh, geez. So. Because we have so much sunshine here in Colorado, it works against our mm -hmm. uh, asphalt pavement. What that sun does is it breaks down a lot of those oils that you'll find in the asphalt, and it starts to reduce that flexibility. So that's the, that's the first issue. Uh, from the day you put that down, it starts to break down. So as it breaks down, you're going to have more cracks because it's less able to move, it can't absorb those loads from either heaving or your trucks or whatever you have. Um, so as that cracking begins, you start to get water into those lower layers, your base, your sub base, and that starts to reduce some of that underlying uh, stability. It's like the box spring on your bed, right? Like that's nice and rigid. Whereas your mattress is kind of like a little bit flexible. Well, if you took like a board out of that box spring, you're going to lose some structure and you're going to start feeling it. So as you lose that structure, your flexibility is going down with the sun. You're getting more water. You're getting more cracks. And this all starts to exponentially speed up over years and years. That's a good analogy. I like that. You can use it any time. <laughs> Minimal cost. That was good. I explain this to a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly <laughs> children, it seems. <laughs> sure, we'll go with children. <laughs> um, so this is a pavement deterioration curve. Um, I'm sure that a lot of you have seen this. Um, on the left-hand side, you start high with good pavement condition at time zero. Now, as you go out, it starts to slowly deteriorate. That's when you're getting that oxidation. Maybe you're getting a few minor cracks. It's really manageable to maintain that. So as you see, the chart starts to uh, dive down. You're having your area of greatest acceleration in your pavement deterioration. And in my opinion, I would say that's where a lot of our streets that we try to attack are. They're in that rehabilitation phase. We want to make sure that they're not going down so fast that they end up at the bottom there in that reconstruction phase. Um, you'll notice from some of the maps that we've provided in this packet, you'll see that the slurry package is really nice and large, whereas the rehabilitation is a little bit smaller because it's so costly. It's inevitable though, I mean. It is, there's ways that you can um, get in front of it or to preserve it. But yeah, inevitably you're gonna have to rehabil or reconstruct certain streets. So, um, something I want you guys to think about with this is too, if you took that curve and flipped that line upside down, that would kind of be your cost curve. So your preventative maintenance is generally your cheapest. It starts off, you can do that, you know, pretty much in years, your early years, maybe year two. And it's a lot cheaper than uh, reconstruction in year 30. So think of it like starting off low and on your left-hand side and ending high on the right-hand side of that graph. So our philosophy is keep the good roads good. <laughs> keep the roads on the, the, the pavement's condition on the top of that curve. <laughs> and keep the bad ones bad. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep them bad. We'll get to them. So that was in Aberdeen Village. <laughs> you said it first. You said it first. So Aberdeen Village, believe it or not, and I'll say this, on this curve, 
is towards that right hand side, but it's still in no. rehabilitation. No. <laughs> so, what? so some of the roads you'll see in There's reconstruction no. are, yeah. you know, really one of, the, one, of the things, one of the things to highlight, which is a question that when yeah. you asked a little bit a while ago about the, the base mm -hmm. and, the, and the thickness of things. So one of the things that you, that's, you see in this community with the age of it, and Aberdeen Village is a perfect example of that. When, when those roads were constructed, your top lift was small and your base was small. We wouldn't build a road like that today. That was in the 60s, I think. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, and so over time, you know, it's we've gotten better at what we do. But you see that. I mean, you look at a road, some of those roads. Ridge Road's a perfect example of that. It was an old county road. It's Now it's a primary east-west connector with a huge amount of traffic on it. But that's not the way it was built to start with. And so there's there's a lot of that in a community like this as it's grown up over time. Um, it, it's just kind of one of the factors that's out there that we're, we're challenged with, particularly here. Yeah, and to add to that, like you said, you, you'll get a higher uh, traffic volume and also larger vehicles potentially, especially as the years have gone on. We have to adapt for larger, heavier vehicles constantly loading on our roadways. You know, if you took a car from the 80s, it weighs a lot less than so your average truck or SUV well, we nowadays. Anything in concrete nowadays? Is there any reason to do concrete? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean you're talking about weight, right? That's yeah. that's typically well, why you run concrete, right? Well, I mean, sometimes there's there's routes like that. Other places you tend to see concrete utilized sometimes are intersections um, or places where you know you have truck or bus pans. Uh, it's turnouts where you have heavier vehicles with a lot more, you know, shoving force um, and that kind of thing. The place you actually see the biggest shoving force is uh, two narrow cul-de-sacs. Big trucks going around narrow mm -hmm. cul-de-sacs. Yeah. Should we go back to brick? <laughs> well, those things actually, like in the city I was once in, the Romans were strong with the cobblestones. Oh, it's Europe, the ride. Europe still has a ton of cobblestone. Yeah. Yeah. The, the ride quality tends to get the phone calls, though. So uh -huh. <laughs> just wait till those things start popping out and. Yeah. <laughs> there road technologies like you know white topping the roads to help with the solar absorption, one to help with the degradation, but also to keep it cooler in the summer. Yeah, we haven't gone through too much white topping just because we do have a lot of or we don't have that much concrete road uh, paving in the city. And Does it have to be on concrete or can it be on uh, asphalt? Primarily concrete. Yeah, I haven't heard about it on asphalt. We used to use toilet paper. We get baked off really quick. Were you, was that your plan? No, or was that that's where you? I got here. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, what is white topping? It would be taken, so it's um, it's light, it's light. Um, on a concrete surface, making it lighter colored. It becomes less of a heat island for absorbing heat and makes it less, uh, reduces your greenhouse gas emissions, your overall heat. It's one of those things that for us, um, as we look as an industry, you know, when you look at how we built parking lots for 30 years, they're giant heat, just giant heat sinks. And so now how do we do that so there's less or more use of things like pervious pavements mm -hmm. that, do, that do allow some of that drainage to go through in the right circumstances as opposed to supplemental storm drainage. Um, infrastructure on the side. So there's a lot of our work in the industry overall and a lot of the innovation is really about how do we drive down um, the greenhouse gas emissions just from the process? Um, how do we make um, reconstructions less costly? How do we make things less of a heat island um, just purely out there and you know, we we all know it. energy to capture that heat? <laughs> <laughs> we try. So, but yeah, concrete does have its own challenges. I will say that. But. We won't touch as much we on those. We don't have a ton of I mean, I, yeah. I'm thinking of bowls, right? I'm thinking of bowls, bowls and bowls. mineral. mineral. Bowls. That's it, yeah. Uh, Prince Street has a little bit. Little bit yeah. of yeah. uh, your panels can mm -hmm. tend to heave, and if they crack. Your bowls? <laughs> yes. We're looking at some. <laughs> we kind of know that. Well, that's good. We're, we're glad our are here checking it for us. We've, we've looked at a few areas on it, so okay. it's on the radar. It's on your radar? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, it's kind of the same thing. That we just talked about obviously you know as you delay your uh, maintenance it becomes more costly so what we're trying to do is stay within the uh, that midsection or as far as we can get towards the left just to have lower costs and reach as much as possible so we have some photos as keith had mentioned um from excellent, and we'll go down to the uh, very poor condition. But on the left-hand side, you'll see a brand new paved road or just mill and overlaid roadway. These aren't all in our community. 
Just so everybody knows. <laughs> not in Aberdeen Village. So I was like, that's not <laughs> South Green <laughs> Street. <laughs> it's the palm trees that gave it away. Ah. So. Um, but yeah, that one on the left, it's you know nice and black. It still has a lot of its oils in that top. Uh, we call them mat, every top mat. Um, it's still flexible. You know, it hasn't been oxidized. This might be a road that's at, you know, year one or two, in my opinion. So still looks pretty nice. Um, on the right-hand side, that is uh, actually South Prince Street. I believe that's headed. I think that's right over by South. Uh, Park in District 1. Isn't that right over the top of the... Oh, is there a median? On the right hand side is you to uh, Santa Fe. We wouldn't build a median like that today and put a tree in it. Yeah. Like two feet wide. On the right hand side is a tree strip of the grass. Yeah. So that so as you go through the as we cycle through these pictures real quick, you know, you, you do your pavement condition index on a scale of zero to hundred. And these are just examples of what would be sort of in each bandwidth if you were personally going out and doing a technical windshield survey. Gotcha. Yeah, you can see that's oxidizing, some minor cracks, things like that. Nothing you'd really feel. Um, then as you get in the 40 to 60 range, you start to see a little bit more um, of that cracking. It starts to form blocks in the road. We actually call it block cracking. Um, you might see one or two small potholes developing here and there. Maybe it needs patching. Um, if there's any kind of sub... Uh, subgrade deterioration from water getting into that material, you might start to see a little bit of movement in your asphalt. Um, enough that- 60 is the score, right? The yeah, pavement score. condition index, just, yeah. just as a little commercial for this also. Um, as we start to talk about you know measuring progress over time and kind of an, an indicator, pavement condition index is probably a factor that you'll see come back to you you know, we have some goals, and I'm, I, I know that our engineering team probably keeps pavement condition index for all the various categories of roads from arterials that are done residentials. But you can kind of pull together kind of an aggregate PCI indicator for the community. And probably as we as we make these investments each year, we'll be interested in coming back and showing the council how we move the needle on our overall pavement condition index. So some of these numbers you'll see and if you you know if you can get a sense in your mind for the condition um we'll have more conversation about this in the future yeah so um yeah 20 to 40 you'll start seeing more large potholes you'll start seeing like the spider web style cracking things like that and um like if you had a cup of coffee without a lid on it i wouldn't really drive without holding it <laughs> on a 20 to 40 because it'll like yeah, it'd be like all over your car, um, but anything above that, you know, you'd be pretty manageable for a quick reference if you're driving our streets later. Um, okay, and then as we get to these lower roadways, um, the under 20, this is when you start to see a lot of your major issues. This is where you'll start getting like a lot of phone calls about maintenance, things like that. You'll start seeing uh, heavy amounts of patching because there will be so many potholes, a lot of that alligator cracking, you might start seeing some of your, uh, your base material underneath your asphalt because all your fines are gone. You might be losing your aggregate that creates your structure. And this is when we either need to do a really heavy amount of patching to be able to mill and overlay that street, or if it's at such a rating, we might just have to go in and you remove all your asphalt, process your base, and uh, redesign that roadway. So these are just some of the methods that we utilize in the industry to uh, as preventative maintenance. Um, things like crack sealing or edge sealing, these prevent water from getting below your asphalt mat and into your subgrade. These are the first steps in preventative maintenance um, patching, it prevents the spreading of cracks. So if you start to get some of that alligator crack, cracking, maybe you have some bad subgrade down there and your roadway is deforming, uh, what you'll do is patch it to prevent that. And then these are surface seals. So surface seals carry a number of purposes. Um, one of them is also to prevent moisture from getting below your asphalt and uh, it literally creates a seal over the road. 
Another one, though, is for that UV protection that we talked about. Something that is becoming more prevalent in the industry is the use of uh, surface seals at very early stages so that we don't lose any of that oxidation. Um, it's something that we are looking at and we're starting to look at for a goal of our program, in my opinion. I'd like to get to a point where we can start getting ahead and doing that and it'll give us a leg up because instead of losing those vines and losing that oil, you're already protecting it. It's like a clear coat on the front of your car. Okay. Is the chip seal, what, what, is, that, is that what you're talking about? Is a chip seal where you're, doing, you're adding that oil back in? So none of these will actually add the oil back into that asphalt mat. Once it's gone, a lot of times it's permanently gone. These are more or less about, uh, sorry, I forgot this analogy. Uh, think of it like your house, right? So as your paint oxidizes, maybe it peels up, you would take some of that off and you would recoat it. What that does is it gives you another um, protective layer against water, UV, things like that. You wouldn't wait till your roads kind of rot or your house is rotting. You would use that preventatively. Oh, chip seals and overlay. Yes. Okay. It's a very thin overlay. Um, an asphalt overlay has a little bit different types of oil in, in it, and it's much more invasive. You wouldn't just put an overlay on the asphalt. You would have to mill it so that you would have that cohesive bond. Right. With the chip seal, it's like a 3 8 inch aggregate with an asphalt emulsion. And then they spray the emulsion over the top to seal that in. They're still doing, but they're still doing an over, uh, still doing a, a mill, right? No, for, for chip seal, no. Chip and slurry, you oh, do not. Do it. <coughs> that emulsion has some water in it, and as that water, uh, we use the term breaks, but as it evaporates, that uh, material bonds to the asphalt right. surface, mm -hmm. so you don't need it. But it is temporary compared to an overlay. This is just like. A, like a recap on your yep, tire. It's just a wearing course. So these are more permanent and more invasive uh, preservation methods. So your melon pave is something that we do a lot in the city with our city crews. Um, we'll go through, take off your top, you know, two inches, uh, generally of material, and then you'll place two inches back. It just gives you a brand new surface. It buys you, you know, a decade or so of years onto that roadway, and it's much less costly than a total reconstruction. As a point of reference, if they teach the city managers, because we t we typically can't keep all of this in our heads, um, these treatments here, like the mill, like um, mill and overlay, you can think might cost ten times what some of those those seal coats that you saw on the, on the last slide. So sure. you, know, you can get it with that chip seal, if you can get it with those other seal coats, yep. that's the way because this is much more expensive. It's not just a little more. What does yeah. it come with Moving the same smell? Curve. What does it cost for that machine? <laughs> well, the milling machine over there that you see in the picture on the far right. left, that's a half a million dollar machine if we were, or three quarters of a million if we were to go buy a new one right now. Is that the one we share with Echo? Uh -huh. yeah. I didn't see anything on our budget for a, a new one. I'm trying, don't worry. I, I promise. I well, on the other hand, here's the challenge with that. I don't have a building to keep it in. Because you have to store it indoors <laughs> in the winter. That's why it's stored at England. Well, serious note, Keith, I think, you, I think you said we are there are contract solutions. Right. That, that's why most yeah. communities contract for this level of, of work. So we, yeah. this is where we're rebalancing our portfolio of what we mill, we outsource some, we pave some. Um, for example, it's hard to find milling companies that want to go in and mill cul-de-sacs or pave cul-de-sacs. So those are part of the challenge. So that's um, that's what you see with machines like that. So it's a, it's a strategy depending on the volume, what you're doing, what the market looks like. They're also, adding to that, they're also extremely difficult to maintain. It requires some, yeah. some special techniques yeah. and knowledge. Um, and transport of these machines is also really. Do they not like the cul de sacs because they, they can't really turn that thing? Yeah. They're, they're it's hard to large. Yeah. The one in the middle is a, uh, a strategy that we haven't used historically in this community, but um, you'll see it um, this year. And it's basically everything is mill, recycle the asphalt that comes oh, through with right. a rejuvenator and goes right back down. It's like a train going down the road. It's yeah. great for straight streets. Um, and one of the cool things about it is um, you can reopen that road shortly after the paving train goes through. 
So it's a, it's a pretty cool tool. We haven't really used that here before. We've used it elsewhere in the in state. So it's um, we're looking forward to using that here in this community. You can do that for concrete too, mm -hmm. especially on highways. Yep. I was going to ask you out. actually how much, like percentage wise of the roads that are going through that significant rehab are actually getting the top layer recycled. Do you know? In the paving train, it's a uh, it's basically a hundred percent. It's basically hundred yeah. percent. You have like a yeah, pretty a hundred percent recovery. That's pretty impressive. It takes it and uh, <coughs> pretty much adds rejuvenators and like specialty oils to it, mm -hmm. and pretty much mixes that with some new material. So in the mill and overlay, we were actually bringing our millings to the hot mix um, asphalt plants, and then they recycle it um, into right. new hot mix. So yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Generally, 100% like, of, of that material is recycled these days. Okay. Can they do a mile in a half a day, or one, one lane mm -hmm. mile and a half a day? It's pretty close. Yeah. Yep. Well, straight shot, it's, yeah. it's a great road. To, it's a great product to use for long straight shots, especially like collectors, arterials, really good, really good. Would product. you ever, oh, would, like, again, back bringing in holes, would you ever pull up that concrete and put down pavement, or is, is that something you're... More, more than likely, my guess would be, having done a few of those in my career, is that you would end up going there and you would actually end up milling the existing road and you would have what's there, reconstruct base, it as a base, yeah. and then come back in over the top of that with asphalt hot yeah. mix, something like that. Because it would be a really solid base. You wouldn't have to pay to drop mm -hmm. as much yeah. off. So, yeah. Pretty loud. yeah. It'd be pretty loud, too. So we'd sure. make sure it was, we do it at night. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. And then reconstruction, obviously, you've all seen what that looks like. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then this particular item, I mentioned this early on, is, you know, in our world today, we'd love to build complete streets. That's the term of having a street that has room for cars, for bikes, for pedestrians, all in a safe, uh, passable manner, um, which looks like this. The challenge in a community like this is your right-of-way has been established for decades. Your lanes have been established for decades. And so what you do is you try and do as best you can from a context-sensitive solution to try and do that. For example, in the last few years, as we've gone in and repaved or chip-sealed or slurry-sealed, we've actually moved some of the, when we restriped, we've moved some of the lines a little bit to add more bike lane room along the sides, which really the cost is the same. We're just moving the striping a little bit. So we're trying to work, we work that into all our concepts. This is a place where we've also used the transportation and mobility board, where we've looked at a corridor that we knew we were going to go in there and pave. It didn't have a lot of assets like this today. So let's go in there and talk through some ideas with them about what might be a good solution. So that's a space where we're using our citizen advisory board to help us in terms of looking at neighborhoods, looking at decisions as we go into things as well. So this is going to be our one of our biggest challenges as a community going forward now that we have money and we're doing work is what do you do? And, it, and an example of this is Aberdeen Village. And we've talked a lot about this. So if you went in and took the TMP um, with its exact strictures in it, we would go in there and we would reconstruct the road and have curb and gutter and sidewalk in, throughout that entire neighborhood. Now, the right-of-way exists to do that, but the difference is, is do we want to go in and put all of that pedestrian infrastructure into a neighborhood like that versus another location in the city that has higher use, higher traffic, and at the same time start taking away 10 or 15 feet of every single every single home's front lawn? You don't need to worry about curb and gutter. We're not going to allow it. That's so, exactly well, right. Now there's like we're going to save money yeah. if you come and do our exactly. Right. It's to come and do yours first. So, so that's where that context sensitive solution is trying to deploy your resources that fit best with the neighborhood you're working in. Because at the end of the day, you're trying to create great neighborhoods. And, and, and you just got to find that right mix depending on what's happened in the past. Like one of the things we have a lot in this community of is we got Hollywood curb out there. You know, we got that rollover curb, which I hate personally. And then we have things like a lot of attached sidewalks that's really narrow like 24 inches that you can't even get a wheelchair on. So how do we work our way through those solutions as we as we go through this process of re, re, rehabbing our community over the next two decades? And that's that's one of the fun parts that we get to, to, to play in is, is how do we make that work in neighborhoods and make those neighborhoods great? You have to build all your roads in preparation for the heaviest vehicle that might come through, or now with a lot of EV vehicles being a lot lighter, are you... Well, you have to assume there's always two things you're going to have on a street. You're always going to have you're always going to have trash trucks, right? And you're always going to have fire trucks. 
So you always have to take those. Wow, so I would think would be another one. Yeah, yeah, they're not quite as heavy. Those dang yeah. fire trucks are heavy. Those are the big ones. You know, I'm surprised that I haven't fallen to Rio Grande out here in the last 25 years, honestly. So, um, you know, and that's where um, you have to do that. But that's why we, we work on things like mapping out truck routes. So if you, if you can minimize the amount of trucks, even if they're heavy, that you get on a particular roadway, that, that adds to your preservation cycle over time. So that's why you map out truck routes through a community and do things like that at the same time. All right, as we look at our overall pavement condition index, as the city manager was alluding to, uh, we undertook an, an investigation of our, all of our pavements in 2022, and the average PCI pavement condition index is 54 on a scale of 0 to 100. We would like to target that number being probably around 70 to 72. Again, keeping the pavements on top of that curve, keeping the good roads good. So we've got a significant backlog of pavements um, that are below that curve. So it's going to take a while to get us up to that 72 target number. But we will get there. We definitely have a plan in place that's going to get us there. But I would estimate it's going to take a decade um, to make up for that backlog. But we have a plan in place. That's the key. Get on the streets, Matt. <laughs> I plan on being out there for a long time. <laughs> um, I know you can't read the numbers on this slide, but the Colorado Pavement, uh, Asphalt Pavement Association does an annual survey of all the local agencies to uh, see what their average pavement condition index is. So the takeaway from this is that Littleton's is 54, and that's in the bottom 25th percentile of all of our peer agencies. So we want to bring that number up so that we're competitive with all of our other local agencies. In, in all honesty, a lot of that ties to, at the end of the day, it ties to, it ties to um, spending and it ties to pre pavement preservation early in that curve. That's what keeps you up there. You know, for example, Sheridan went out and did this huge bond and paved all their streets at once. Think about the size of the bubble they have out there if they don't do maintenance because everything's aging at the same time. So that's going to be a challenge for them as they figure out how to manage their pavement in the decades to come. Sure, to have the highest. Ninety-seven. I think so. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's all right. Yep. We beat out somebody like Kit Carson County. They only had like eight miles of paved road in the whole county. So <laughs> that's we're better we than them. We're better than them. Yeah. So. In 2022, we undertook about a million dollars worth of pavement management projects, and we had a lot more that were programmed, but um, the pandemic impacts um, on the industry have been rather significant. The um, labor shortages and material supplies have really put a challenge um, in, in the industry in order to, uh, the capacity um, to execute projects. So we've seen a lot of our projects that we have designed and bid um, delayed um, by anywhere from three to six months um, at times. So everything that we want to do, it's still out there. It's still ready to go. The industry just doesn't have the capacity to execute. And so hopefully, um, as we go into 23, that's going to improve. But no guarantees. There's a lot of work out there. There's a lot of money out there. Um, so we'll see what that brings. Uh, we undertook a lot of other um, infrastructure and projects, traffic signal pole replacement, some intersection improvements at uh, County Line and Lucent. Uh, replacement of the Rio Grande Bridge out here, um, 1929 era bridge, so oldest bridge in the city. Um, and then as well, we, we look at our network of underground infrastructure, sanitary sewer and storm sewer. That's an important um, asset that the city owns. So we undertake a lot of rehabilitation and uh, replacement projects there. In 2023, we're looking at an investment of $6 million. Um, that is probably triple what we have done on an average basis um, from a pavement management perspective. So large volume of projects across the gamut of the different preservation techniques that Matt talked about. Um, the hot in place recycling, the pavement train, that's gonna be on County Line Road um, coming up this, hopefully the spring. <coughs> yeah. There's some pictures of some people come and watch it. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you guys would like to watch it, do let me know because uh, our representative is a man named Todd Conser. <laughs> He, everyone knows Todd in our area, um, but he's always like, yeah, let it, everyone know you're coming. We'll bring breakfast Love burritos. Parties. <laughs> yeah. So it, they use it as a big uh, learning experience. So, so are you doing, County Line is from Santa Fe to where? To South Park Terrace. To short of Broadway. Yeah. Just, okay. Just because. Oh, that road is horrible. There will be, we did some patching on it uh, as a preventative maintenance. So you have to prepare that road for this project. And as Brent mentioned, uh, 
they got held up in some other areas. It delayed their schedule a little bit. We had to complete some work on County Line and Lucent, and we will be <coughs> early on in their schedule next year. Or they told That's us in concert with really like Douglas year. County? Mm -hmm. 23, okay. sorry. 23. Okay. Yeah. yeah, 23. Yeah, we're there now. Yeah, we're this year. Yeah. So, yeah. So glad. Um, and, and this is just a map of the overall pavement preservation uh, projects, and um, these maps are in, in your packet, more detailed maps, too. Certainly we can dive into details on specific streets if you're interested. But We'll do that when you specifically read yeah. um, mm -hmm. on the other side. So. In addition to pavement management, um, the $36 million. You, sorry, I would like to go back just to that last sure. slide. That is, that's going to be a lot of the messaging that we're talking about. We, we want to get the word out, you know, just looking at the numbers, that's probably 50 miles or so of some sort of surface treatment, which is going to make an impact. We need to tell that story, and it's we're going to find different ways beyond maps like this to get the word out to uh, residents so that, that they know that that work's happening and that they know how uh, important that is. So this is a really important slide, even though we don't need to read through what's happening in, in every neighborhood. But as you look at the lines, there's something happening everywhere which and, is and, and to go to what jim says that's one of our big targets as communications this year is to build out that information for the public get that in front of everybody um, and really get that out there one of the things that we developed a, a couple of years ago is we actually were able to take all the paving maps that go back to 1990 and put them in a progressive map so you can see what's happened over the last 40 years interestingly enough you can see the investment decline and the cost of the services go up at the same time based on square footage and so this is going to allow us people people in the new website are going to be able to go in there look at their street look at their address know when it's coming up what's in front of them this year next year the year after um, so that they can get a good handle on where we're spending their money and we're going to keep them informed of that all along the way i thought we already had that built up we don't have that we do. Yeah. yeah, and we will have signs crediting yeah. 3A where mm -hmm. it's where it's, good. it's appropriate. Did you want your that faces word. on those? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so contractor versus city. So that mm -hmm. is that just what it is? It's a well for us. It's um it's a mix. It depends on um, like our crews are actually we brought out um, two years ago we brought. Colorado Asphalt Pavement Association, and they're the part. They're both public and private, and we had them. Um, frankly, the easiest way to put this is we had them hide in the bushes and evaluate um, our crews for performance and quality. Um, and uh, the report that we got back was that our crews pave as fast with a higher quality than most of the private vendors in the front range. Right. And so we, what we do is we have a, we have a mix of it. Like last year, we made a decision to to outsource a lot more milling to get ahead so that our crews could do work. And it, it's just that that's the dynamic that Matt and Brent live with every day is how do we put the, the pieces on the chessboard in the right place to deliver the highest value based on what we're going to try and accomplish for that season. So that Northwest is contractor? Northwest will be city, actually. Yep. 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 That'll be in-house resources being the, doing the milling overlay. He and, says contractor. No, I was... I misspoke. They they know it better than I do. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, but there's sub maps in there for everything. Yeah. So. Check oh. if you look at your legend, uh, it'll explain it. Um, Aberdeen Village, we would have liked it to have been city, but there's a certain capacity that we have. Um, that northwest corner, the amount that our city crews are doing is a good amount more than they've historically done. But we're hoping to be really ambitious this year, line everything up and execute according to plan. Out of curiosity, this legend, is it, does it graduate from, you know, uh, most invasive to less yeah. invasive? No, no it's just, it, okay. Those sub maps, the ones that are in the packet that you don't see in the slides, those really break down the different treatments across the city, and you'll be able to see which ones are the more invasive versus the less. That's what those supplemental maps are for. So trail mark is nothing? No, trail mark, actually, we do a lot of work in Trailmark. This past year, in 22, they had a ton of work done because they have um, water issues and water table issues, and we did a whole bunch of underdrain work out there to, for from long from a long-term preservation methodology. So we do work out there pretty frequently. So. All right. Um, in addition, the newest to streets in the city, too. Mm -hmm. New is relative, right? Yeah. Relative. Yeah. <laughs> In addition to uh, the pavement management projects, we have some major capital investment in transportation infrastructure. 
um, signal pole replacement, some fiber projects, major intersection improvement projects um, along Platte Canyon, the Quad Road, of course, that everybody is familiar with. Um, most of these being grant funded projects, so really important investments and leveraging that we're undertaking with the grants. On top of that, a um, number of um, underground infrastructure projects on sanitary sewer and storm sewer. So, yes. So this is the punchline slide. This is what the whole thing leads to. So basically, um, we're you always end this way. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we're going to spend more than thirty-six million dollars this year on infrastructure investment in this community. Nice. Um, nice. To put that in perspective, as was mentioned earlier. Um, that this single year total is greater than 2000 to 2015 spent on infrastructure in this city combined. So we're going to do a decade, more than what was done in a decade and a half just this year. And that's a direct result of um, going, you know, you all working with the community to let them know that investing in their community through 3A and other methodologies is important. The commitment that council made when we um, broke up with the fire department to shift that money over to street maintenance. And the one thing that I want to highlight actually on this slide is, I, sometimes I call it the fire divorce. It just depends. I, 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 I haven't heard it put that way before. We joined South Metro. That's correct. <laughs> Our citizens joined South Metro after, after whatever <laughs> happened South before South. that. You know? So they, when they get remarried. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that I think is really cool actually about this slide is um, we work with Tiffany to make sure you, know, you can see where all the funding from that is coming from. But one of the things that to me is really exciting about this slide is there is $14 million on that slide that's coming from outside of Littleton. And that's not a place that we have been historically here. And, you know, that's, you know, you're looking at a third of your infrastructure spending for the year is coming from outside this community to leverage those dollars. And that ratio puts this community at the top of the list of your peers without question out there from a, a community investment standpoint. And that's a really exciting story to tell that the folks here, every dollar that our folks um, are investing in the community is getting leverage. Um, you know, for every 66 cents they're spending, 33 cents is getting added to that from outside of our community to, to really extend what we do. And that's a great story to tell at the same time. That's awesome. So, so that's a pretty cool place to be. And so much of that, you know, you've at the our councils have provided a lot of leadership to get us there. Our technical staff has done an amazing job of bringing the grant money in, our finance team. All of that has been part of getting to this space so that we can really, you know, turn the city black, in essence, is, you know, kind of the term to do it. So it's an exciting time. And, and uh, yes, they, people may feel like they're living on the New York State Thruway for a few years um, where it's always constant construction. But um, it's going to be an exciting time this year and into the future years as well. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, the last thing is that we have built into our programs um, a lot. We're going to have, you know, the usual public outreach. We're out there with door hangers, newsletters, HOAs, all that kind of stuff well in advance. Our contractors are required to do that. We use a lot of uh, variable message boards to get, you know, work out there ahead of people. In addition to that, we're going to be really, really leveraging the new website um, and continuing to take advantage of that and social media as we, as we do that. Um, and then having people be able to look and see where we're going as a community to know where their street is, to know where their project is. So those are all exciting things that are straight in front of us on the horizon as well and are going to be huge tools for us to be successful while we go forward and also help you tell the story um, when when your constituents come and talk to you. So. Great. Thank you. Is Domino's done paving for pizza too? Yes, <laughs> yes. Ironically, I do have a funny story to tell about that. So for those of you, Gretchen, I think is you know new or Steve wasn't here, is we were the Colorado community that was awarded the paving for pizza grant by Domino's. They had a national campaign that gave a donation, gave a contribution to each community, and it was tied to, you know, if your pizza gets there and it's all trashed up, we'll replace it. So we were the Colorado the community, and we got a lot of feedback from Domino's that we did put on the best event, um, you know, and our, our crews actually had a elementary school children singing and cheering for them. Although it's kind of ironic because we didn't, we cut a big enough hole that we had to go get another load and everybody left. And so our crews are out there paving to complete silence, like two hours later, <laughs> no. which is what it's really like um, when we did the job. But for those of us that are in this business, there's a nice little, um, you know, communications and 
did a great video of the you know the whole event and those kind of things. And the one thing that sticks out to us is Tyler shot drone footage of Houston wearing, which is the street we did it on, and we all have the same reaction. Holy cow! There's a lot of crack seal in this. <laughs> is the reaction that we have when we see the video because you know that's what we focus on. So, but the that's you know Kyle. I mean, the, the part about that for me when we did that was it wasn't about the money that we got from Domino's. It was about another way to tell the story of why people needed to invest in this. And those are the you know looking at that last slide is the dividends that pays to to invest in our community and have the community believe that we're doing the right things for them. Any questions? Why don't we use toilet paper anymore? But we got national news on that one. Because there was a shortage <laughs> in 2020. Were you hoarding toilet paper during COVID again, Jerry? Sorry. So, yeah, so yeah, for yeah. Mayor Pro Tem, so I forgot, it, I this was, I don't know how long ago, but they, they put over the crack seal, they would lay yeah. toilet so, paper down. Literally. So people wouldn't drive over and get the, the grease from their cars. Part. There. So it's, a, it's a technique that's used in different parts of the country. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, the challenge for us is we we don't get as much precipitation as some of those other areas. And those other areas, it just kind of vanishes, but you, got you know, is sand here, another option? What yeah, you don't want to. Go the, the, the downside <laughs> of sand is that we end up having to sweep that up later mm -hmm. to, to, you know, on the water quality side, yeah, so yeah, keep yeah. that stuff out of the river and the stormwater system. So, but we appreciate all your support. Thanks for helping us grow. So, I guess I have a question. Uh, we're using 12 million of 3A on our roads. How much money are we getting from 3A this year? I think it was like 15. Point seven will be in the fund. I think something like that. Because we have to. Yeah. Turned off my computer. Oh, okay. You mean you don't know off the top of your head? Tiffany would <laughs> estimate eleven million or so for the year. For twenty twenty three, yeah, probably about. 11, I think eleven point five, eleven point eight. But we had over. We have fund balance from twenty twenty two. Of what? We're using for twenty twenty three. Nine million. For a refresher for me too, would you remind people how they can check their address and when they're expected to work on those well, streets? Oh, go outside the front door, turn around, look. And they see their address. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, I'm talking about on the website. Right? Yeah, we're, we're still building out those details on the website. So oh, it's, I, I, I we had we had it we had set something up on the old website. Oh, gotcha. So some of that's transferred over, and now we're working with. Um, you know, IT and communications to really build out um, almost kind of, you know, one of the things that is to have a lot of this detail and more information for people that we just didn't have in the past. So they'll be able to, there'll be a tool in there for people to be able to go in and check that. Okay, so we don't have that right now. Gonna, is, I know it's going to populate with like, uh, you know, potential construction activity and stuff like that. Are you also going to populate it with like condition analysis stuff as well? We would like to. Okay, sorry, that may be asking no, I mean, a no, lot. It's, that means, well, it's like, huh, my street is well, better than your street. It's actually a kind yeah. of an interesting, you know, thing to do with your well, neighbors. You know, one of the things that, like, we've talked about where we'd love to get to in this business, and we talk about this with community development, is, you know, you should be able to go to a map of the city and, you know, click on your lot and see all the documentation that's there historically related to it, where do the utilities lay, so you can get all that stuff straight up through the web. There's some great examples of that around the country. Um, tell you what, zone issues lay over the top of it and so that's a place that we're striving towards that's part of a you know we've been in a big project to digitize all of our public works records so that we can bring that to have people be available with those kind of things so cool so that's where we'd love to get to we have that done by june yeah Try it. <laughs> well we got to get the we got to get this the scanning done because bert's finally going to retire after 57 million years. Cersei, on that <laughs> other piece where they can check address, are you thinking that's uh, six months out, a year? Oh, out? no, it'll, it'll be sooner than that. Okay. It'll be sooner than that. What we'll do is we'll follow up with um, we'll follow up with the IT and the communications yeah, team. Yeah, because it's already specific. created. It would mm -hmm. seem pretty easy yeah, to run. Yeah, the address was the first dashboards with all the projects going on throughout the city. And right, There's right. some more information yeah. on all those. Yeah. yeah. We'll get we'll get you an update on the specific timeline for that as a follow-up. Yeah, just just yeah, for sure. That's awesome. I like it. That's great. All right. Good so excited. Guys. Good job. Thank you. Uh, city manager, any update report? No reports tonight. Here you go, Ray. City attorney. No report. Oh. Ah. Patrick, oh my God. <laughs> Patrick, someone put a quarter in Patrick's bag. <laughs> 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 All right, and so it's eight point three, and we are still talking about energy right now.